If I didn't make it clear enough in the last video, I really like Super Metroid. I think it's an excellent game and that opinion is shared by many even back when it was first released. So logically, when you have something so popular and successful, the next step would be to work on a new game, maybe for a certain 64-bit system that you're working on. In 1996, Nintendo released their third home console, the Nintendo 64. And along with its competitors, the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn ushered in the next big thing for video games, 3D visuals and gameplay. One small problem though, Nintendo hates keeping up with the times. The company was stubborn and stuck with cartridges for the N64 instead of the much more memory efficient CD format, meaning that the system was harder to develop games for. Combine that with the new challenge of transitioning from 2D to 3D and what we were left with was a console with a few great standout titles, but that's just it. A few. Mario and Zelda made the leap to the third dimension successfully, but other Nintendo franchises played it safe by sticking to 2D and some IPs just didn't make the cut. Mother 3 was being developed for this… what the hell is this shape? but was cancelled as a result of just being way too ambitious for the hardware. No new Kid Icarus or Fire Emblem, and yes, no new Metroid. Super Smash Bros. featured Samus as one of the 12 playable characters, which confirmed that Nintendo knew Metroid was popular enough to be featured in their new All-Star fighting game. But then again, this game also had a NES, and I think I can speak for every kid when they first played Smash Bros. What the fuck is a NES? But then, as if they were making up for the lack of Metroid in the N64 era, in the early 2000s, Nintendo confirmed that soon we weren't going to just get one new Metroid game, but two new Metroid games. That sounds familiar. One was going to be the series' long-awaited 3D debut, while the other would be the direct sequel to Super Metroid, Metroid 4, later revealed as Metroid Fusion. Yoshio Sakamoto directed the fourth Metroid game again, alongside Takahiko Hosokawa and produced by Takahiro Izushi. Unfortunately, Gunpei Yokoi passed away on October 4, 1997 in a car accident, making Super Metroid his last official involvement with the series. Rest in peace, good sir. Metroid Fusion was shown off a few times before its release, most notably at E3 2001 and 2002. These early showcases were obviously very early builds of the game, with Samus donning a darker suit, the presence of anti-gravity, but the game continued to evolve and eventually resembled something that looked a little more familiar by 2002. The detail of Samus having a different suit stuck around though and… wait no, that's the real Samus. But the trailers were framing the game as if you're controlling the new blue Samus. What's going on? Well, it wouldn't be much longer before fans found out. Metroid Fusion was first released on November 18th, 2002 for the Game Boy Advance, the same day as Metroid Prime on the GameCube. Can I just say how jealous I am that I wasn't old enough at the time to experience this event? Two brand new Metroid games on the same day, that's something straight out of a dream. Ah, the Game Boy Advance. This was the very first game system that I ever played. So many memories playing Donkey Kong Country, the Mario Advance games, Yoshi Topsy Turvy. Which, if you're curious to learn what it's like to play Yoshi Topsy Turvy, here you go. Of course I wouldn't be exposed to Metroid until much later, so I didn't know what a Metroid Fusion was until around 2010 I want to say. I tried it out on one of my friend's computers via an emulator. Problem was, I had to play using a keyboard, and playing 2D games with a keyboard might as well be the 8th deadly sin. It was dreadful, but I liked what I saw. I wouldn't try it out again until 2014 when it was put on the Wii U eShop. The sequel to what was my equivalent of crack, how could I pass this up? Unlike the games that I've covered in these videos so far, Fusion was the first Metroid I went into where I knew quite a bit about it through YouTube reviews and Let's Plays. I knew it was going to be more handholdy than Super Metroid. While the number of times I've played Super Metroid is around the same as the population of California, I've played Fusion a total of… 3 times, and one of those times was for this review. I promise this is not telling of the game's quality. Metroid Fusion is the most plot driven 2D Metroid game by a mile. Super Metroid had that opening narration that lasted like 2 minutes tops. Metroid Fusion not only has a much longer cutscene at the beginning, but the game is littered with dialogue throughout. So what exactly is going on that warrants having this much text? You boot up the game and are greeted with a scene of Samus… dying. Welcome to the Gulag. After the events of Super Metroid, Samus has returned to SR388, this time with the company of a crew from the Galactic Federation Biologic Space Laboratories, or BSL, where they come across a strange organism that attaches itself to Samus. Because for some reason nobody thinks to figure out what that thing was or if it's dangerous, they all leave the planet and on their way back to the BSL station, Samus begins to lose consciousness, causing her to lose control of her ship and it just yeets itself toward a convenient asteroid belt. 
Samus survives the accident as she was ejected from her ship at the last second and is picked up by the BSL crew. After running some tests, it's discovered that the thing that flew into her suit is a parasite known as an X. It is incredibly deadly and has infected Samus to the point that she is in critical condition. Luckily, a vaccine is manufactured just in time to save her life. Made out of some cell samples from the baby Metroid since the Metroid species is the natural predator of the X parasite, Samus is cured, only she's not 100% back to normal, since the infection had spread to large chunks of her power suit and needed to be surgically removed. With a new look and most of her shit gone yet again, though this is basically the only game where it kinda makes sense considering the circumstances, Samus is given almost no time to rest and is deployed to investigate a disturbance in the BSL station. She's got a new ship, powered by an AI that strangely reminds Samus of a former commanding officer of hers, prompting her to nickname the computer Adam after her CEO. It takes almost no time to find out that the X are responsible for the ruckus in the station and are essentially trying to spread like a virus. The X have a way of replicating the physical appearances of their hosts, a terrifying concept that's made even more terrifying when Samus and Adam find out that the same X from the beginning of the game is here, patrolling the BSL station and mimicking Samus down to her power suit and full supply of weapons. The mission is clear, find any survivors and kill all the X before they spread across the entire galaxy. Fusion probably has the most fleshed out story in the series. It spends time going into the specifics of how the X work as a species, and explores Samus' thought process through inner monologues as more events begin to unfold. In the end, your main goal is no more complicated than it was in the past games. If it moves, kill it. But I appreciate the attempt to tell a story that develops as you play, and I believe that it pays off. But as a consequence of being more story driven than the previous games, Fusion is a much more straightforward and linear Metroid experience. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it does introduce a few bothersome quirks. And the biggest of these is your ship's computer, Adam. Your gameplay will periodically be interrupted by these newly added navigation rooms you have to stop at so that Adam can fill you in on the current situation and tell you where your next objective is. It's here where much of the story is told through dialogue, which I feel Fusion is a little too bloated with. This is an issue that would be fixed if you were allowed to skip these scenes in case you just aren't interested or are doing a second playthrough, but you can't. You can't skip any of the cutscenes in this game actually. The most you can do is speed up the text a little, but when there's over a dozen of these across your half a dozen hours or so of playtime, it starts to become a nuisance. I understand the plot is being emphasized much more now, but when the rest of the game is so fast paced these navigation rooms only halt the game's flow. This is the main reason why this is probably my favorite Metroid game that I replay the least. Yeah, I can always speed this stuff up with an emulator or something like that, but I don't always want to use an emulator, you know? It'd be nice if I can press a button that skips past all of this so I can keep playing, because as much as I enjoy the story, actually playing the game is still the best thing about Fusion. The game is like a much tighter, quicker version of Super Metroid for multiple reasons. For one, the controls have been tweaked to make the game much easier to pick up and play for newcomers. Jumps are still a little floaty, but it is much easier to do precision platforming and turning on both land and water isn't as slow as last time. A huge difference that caught me off guard the first time I played was the removal of the run button. Super Metroid's run button was great because it gave you more control over your speed and jumps, but that's only if you mastered managing Samus' acceleration and momentum, which isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. Now, not counting the speed booster, Samus has one consistent running speed, which means you have much more consistent jumping angles. And the spin jump, and this applies to the space jump and screw attack as well, have also been made easier to execute since now Samus will transition into the spinning animation with the press of the jump button even after a normal jump. I'm happy to report that the default button mapping no longer wants to murder your hands. There's less buttons to work with, but the way the developers mapped to different actions was incredibly smart in my opinion. Switching to missiles and power bombs is as simple as holding down the right shoulder button in combat and morph ball mode respectively. No run button means that you can now charge your beam while jumping without worrying about not constantly being at full speed, unless you actually prefer playing like a lobster for whatever reason. Aiming diagonally up and down is now exclusively on the left shoulder button, and you switch between the two directions by pressing up or down on the d-pad. And this game introduces the power grip, allowing Samus to grab onto ledges and hoist herself up. An ability that I honestly really miss when I replay any other Metroid game that doesn't have it, which is basically just Metroids 1 through 3 and the Prime games. Casually speaking, Fusion just plays better than Super Metroid, thanks to the removal of all these different factors that complicated Samus' control in the last game, but at the same time, you can argue that they're simplified to the point where there's not as much room to improve how you play the game. You've got a constant running speed now, but that eliminates the curiosity of which jumps you can and can't make. The wall jump has been stripped of much of its utility, because you are forced to use two walls now no matter what. Gone is the incentive to try out which areas you can access a little earlier with this move. You can still morph in mid-air, but any vertical momentum you had gets cut completely, and it just feels wrong. 
That happens when you accidentally aim your gun in the middle of a jump as well. Fusion set out to make Metroid more accessible to play, but it came at the cost of those cool tricks you were able to do in Super Metroid where it felt like the sky was the limit for what was possible to achieve. The most impressive games to me are those with gameplay that is simple to get a grasp of, but requires a ton of effort and dedication to get really fucking good at. Fusion just feels more strict in how you're able to play it, and like you can't improvise as much as you could in Super Metroid. The simplification of the controls is reflected in the game structure. As I stated, Fusion is a much more linear adventure than its predecessors. To start off, you're no longer on an alien planet. The entire game takes place on the BSL station, which is divided into six major sectors. Sector 1 is supposed to be a replica of SR388's ecosystem. Sector 2 is tropical themed, Sector 3 is fire themed, Sector 4 has a bunch of water, Sector 5 is super cold, and Sector 6 is really fucking dark. Throughout your journey you'll be required to visit most of these areas multiple times, each time making you explore more of that location than the last time you were there. This sounds like it'd be a little tedious having to constantly backtrack to a sector you've just been to because the story mandates it. And it would be if it weren't for how these places are designed to be bite-sized rather than being as large as say a Brinstar or a Norfair. Would I have preferred maybe having a few more unique sectors to eliminate the risk of redundancy completely? Of course. But Metroid Fusion doesn't really have this issue cause, like I said, it's not like the game is asking much when you'll only spend about 4-5 to five minutes max getting from one sector to another. What I'm not that big of a fan of is the look of these areas. Sure they all have their different themes that give them all a distinct flair, but apart from the rooms that are obviously supposed to reflect that specific sector's aesthetic, everything else ends up looking pretty samey and generic. I feel that this was inevitable considering how the setting is more industrial in this game. It'd be a little difficult to not have some parts of the map that look similar to one another. Don't think I'm trying to imply that it's as bad as Metroid 1 and 2, god no. It's just something to keep in mind if you're going into this game blind. You just gotta pay a little extra attention to landmarks and make good use of your map to be able to identify exactly where you are. On a more positive note, hot damn, I really dig the soundtrack and sound design of Metroid Fusion. I'd say the OST is about on the same level as Super Metroid. It has a good combination of atmospheric and upbeat tunes. The Sector 1 music is one of my favorite songs in the series, I think it does a great job representing how this is Samus' most dangerous and frightening mission up to this point, more on the frightening parts later. The sound effects are what really impressed me though. When there's an explosion in this game like from a bomb or missile impact, you feel that shit. The only complaints I have with the audio is, sadly, power bombs. Which is crazy because they sounded so awesome in Super Metroid. But here? It's like you're flushing a toilet. Also, they got rid of the item pickup fanfare for literally every item expansion and upgrade. Now it'll only play for major power-ups and the first pickup for things like missiles and power bombs. Except for energy tanks, I think they just kinda gave up there. Power-ups as a whole are handled differently in Fusion than other games, both in how they're obtained and how some of them function. Because Samus, you know, nearly died at the beginning, she has to recover her lost items again. A lot of them are handed to you through these rooms where you download data that grants you a new ability. Every other item is now obtained by defeating a boss infected by an X-Parasite, and it's really creative how they use the upgrades they're guarding to gain an edge in battle. Whether it's a spider space jumping or an eel shine sparking, it's a pretty cool mechanic and bosses are more abundant because of this. Though with the exception of Nightmare, they're all pathetically easy. And Nightmare is really only difficult at first when you aren't sure how to exploit his movement patterns. But yeah, back to power-ups. Most of the usual staples are here and accounted for. You've got your energy tanks, morph ball, charge beam which is busted as hell when used at close range, the high jump and spring ball have been combined into one upgrade which is very convenient, same goes for super missiles which literally just replace regular missiles now, various suit and gravity suit make a return, the classic beams come back except the spacer that's been replaced by the wide beam. It's basically the spacer. And no ice beam cause remember, Samus is technically part Metroid now so she has an increased vulnerability to cold. And this game has some sort of fetish for power bombs cause there are a grand total of... 74! Who said that? You've got your classic space jump and screw attack and the speed booster, though I'm not as big of a fan of it in this game because someone also apparently had a fetish for the shine spark. But there's a lot of instances now where you're required to pull off some borderline ridiculous shit with it when going for that coveted 100% completion. Oh we'll get to this later, don't worry. There are only two new weapons to play with, ice missiles which basically just combine the ice properties of the ice beam with missiles, and diffusion missiles. And the grappling beam is nowhere to be found since the level design is a lot more condensed so there wasn't much of a reason to keep it. Again, getting these items one by one does a great job of making you feel like you're getting stronger and stronger the more you play. 
My main problem is that it isn't as fun to experiment with these upgrades as it was in Super Metroid because of just how railroaded the adventure is. You're always told where to go with a big glowing dot marking your destination on the map. And even when it isn't totally spelled out for you, you will quickly realize there's one clear main route you have to take during your initial visit in each sector. The thing is, despite this being one of the most straightforward Metroid games, at points, it's one of the most confusing. Fusion loves bombable walls and blocks, and putting random triggers on the floor for you to bomb to unveil some large metal dildo so you can reach the next room to progress. And with the removal of the x-ray scope, newcomers I feel will have a bitch of a time figuring out what they need to do to advance in certain rooms. It's weird, Metroid Fusion is at the same time more user-friendly than Super Metroid but decides to pull shit like this. The map is also a little weird this time around. I like how items you haven't collected yet are marked with open circles, but Super Metroid at least didn't have straight up invisible sections in its map that you'd have no way of knowing even exist if you don't spend a shit ton of your time laying power bombs everywhere. The map system took one step forward but another step back. And nowhere is this problem highlighted more than in the post game. <sighs> okay. Remember how much I praise Super Metroid's level design for being created in a way that allowed experienced players to collect every collectible on their way to the final boss without asking them to go off the beaten path a whole lot? Metroid Fusion looked at that and thought, fuck completionists, let's waste as much of their time as possible. What do I mean by that? They barfed out an unnecessary amount of screw attack blocks and tauntingly hid a bunch of the items behind them, so that after completionists obtained the screw attack right before the final stretch of the game from defeating Ridley, who was piss easy by the way and his screams are the equivalent of nails on a chalkboard, Players are forced to backtrack to almost every sector to collect those blocked off items if they want those cool 100% endings. And if you accidentally enter a navigation room during this part of the game, you are prevented from ever going back to look for any upgrades that you may have forgotten about. What was the point of this? To give the game more value? Well, it doesn't give the game more value, it's just obnoxious. It's wasting my time for the sake of wasting my time when the previous game that came out 8 years earlier had already gotten this shit right. You may be thinking that I'm focusing on this a bit too much, but there's two reasons for this. One, this isn't the last time I'm going to be bitching about an arbitrarily long post game in this Road to Metroid Dread series, so I may as well get most of my thoughts out about this dumb trend in the review of the game that started it. And two, a huge part of my ideal Metroid experience is going after all of these items. I'm not only given a tally at the end of the game, but I'm actually rewarded in a gameplay sense for going the extra mile. It's as if I'm missing out on a good chunk of the pie when I don't collect every item. It's a satisfying accomplishment when I see those three digits. What annoys me is that they got it right the first time. They succeeded in making the 100% journey a fun challenge rather than a chore in Super Metroid. It's demoralizing when no matter how much you've memorized the map and every power-up location, there's nothing you can do about these shitty roadblocks that prevent you from grabbing collectibles along the way. It's as if they're treating skilled players like children with training wheels, but the wheels are never removed. I admit this is a very subjective and personal opinion, but it's an opinion that I wanted to voice anyways. At least I can say it doesn't really detract from the quality of the final product in the grand scheme of things. I realize that quite a bit of this video has been kind of negative towards Fusion. A stark contrast to the last video where I had almost nothing but positive things to say about Super Metroid. But don't get the wrong impression, Metroid Fusion is a great game. It's just filled with a few tiny things that bother me, I can't help it. But I don't let those take away from how enjoyable the game is to play. It's a lot more action-packed than previous Metroid games, and with the exception of the abundance of navigation room cutscenes, has a breakneck pace and its gameplay rarely slows down. When you get into it, it's incredibly addicting, a lot like Super Metroid. You're playing, and when you decide it's time to stop for the day, you say to yourself, just one more item, or just one more boss fight, like a junkie desperate for another hit. The basic act of mowing down hordes of enemies is very satisfying. Even though there aren't a lot of opportunities to break the game, there's still merit in trying to beat the game as quickly as possible. Samus' defense is pretty pitiful here, but I find myself playing more recklessly in Fusion than almost every other Metroid game. The game is at its best when you can just keep the momentum going without stopping. The bosses aren't anything to write home about, but the enemies can be pretty aggressive. There's a good variety of enemies around the BSL station, and I love how their deaths and abilities to respawn ties into the lore since at their core, these are all ex-parasites masquerading as different creatures. And can I just say how much I adore the art style? The Game Boy Advance is already known for pretty much being a portable Super Nintendo, with its main drawbacks being a small screen that results in screen crunch in certain games, and more washed out colors. Well, not only do I think that Fusion's camera is perfect how it is since the game is designed around it, but it looks so lively. Everything in this game pops, each sprite is very pronounced thanks to their vibrant colors and complexity. The animations are top notch, and the bold outlines around the characters give the illusion of a moving comic book or manga. 
When all is said and done, Fusion just has one of the clumsier executions of the Metroid formula post Super Metroid, that's all. Doesn't change the prevailing opinion that it's a Metroidvania that's still very much worth your time and money. I felt it was necessary to clear this all up before I finished summarizing the story. I still love Fusion, I always will, and my complaints, lots of which have been pretty subjective, will never change that. Samus spends quite a bit of time running around the BSL station, killing the ex-parasites she comes across and slowly discovering that every crew member has been, well, murdered. On a few occasions, you will come face to face with the SAX, or the saxophone as I like to call it. And these are the parts I was referring to that feel like they're straight out of a survival horror game. Your first time playing, you'll be running with shit in your pants as this absolute unit hunts you down with the sole intention of ending your life. That is until you find a wall to hide behind and it just... <laughs> gives up. Eventually, there's a scene revealing that some people in the Galactic Federation have ulterior motives for sending Samus to the BSL station, as they communicate with Adam and talk about some pretty shady stuff, all of which is revealed to Samus as the game's climax approaches. She reaches a secret laboratory where she finds a bunch of capsules containing various Metroids in their different evolutionary stages. This small lab initiates an ejection sequence though when the SAX goes apeshit and begins attacking a bunch of little baby Metroids that pay no mind to Samus since, to them, she is one of their own. Samus escapes the lab in the nick of time, and Adam reveals that, of course, those Metroids were a result of the Galactic Federation's efforts to breed them. They claim their intentions aren't malicious, but so did Skynet, and we all know how that went. Things get even more suspicious when Adam informs Samus that the Galactic Federation are on their way since they now wish to study the X, and have been purposefully withholding information and upgrades from her so she wouldn't get in the way of their plans to also capture the SAX. Samus, understandably, calls out how stupidly dangerous their plans are and convinces Adam that they have to destroy the entire station. The computer agrees after it reveals that it is in fact not just a random AI, but is literally Adam himself. The AI was apparently created using a digital version of the real Adam Malkovich's consciousness before he passed away. With their combined efforts, the two find a way to set the station's course to collide directly with the planet SR-388, killing two birds with one stone so that the Federation will have no possible way of exploiting the Metroid or the X ever again. Samus has one final confrontation with the SAX, where she finally comes out on top. Great little story detail here. The monster that the SAX transforms into is the same type of creature it originally infected in the prologue before it infected Samus. Again, I love shit like that. The SAX cowardly floats away and Samus runs back to her ship to escape the station. But she returns not to her ship, but... We've been trying to reach you concerning your car's extended warranty. <laughs> Hey! You're hurting her. <laughs> Samus absorbs the SAX's lingering life force and regains her ice beam ability to kill the true last Metroid in the galaxy. Her ship returns thanks to the help of the friendly animals from Super Metroid. You actually encounter them earlier in one of the labs. The only survivors of this whole mess and the reason why Samus makes it out in one piece. You see, there is a good reason to save them. But wait, if saving the animals is canon, then that means... Oh no. I'm sorry, little one. The BSL station crashes into the surface of SR-388 and both the station and the planet go out in an enormous explosion. Note to self, don't invite Samus to your home planet, it'll fucking explode. Samus reflects on what has transpired, wondering what repercussions her actions will have in her future since, you know, she's basically a criminal at this point. Fusion has a very open-ended conclusion that leaves a lot of room to continue the story in an interesting way. Can't wait to see where we go from here. Ah! There's multiple ending screens you can unlock if you meet certain stipulations. Beating the game under a certain amount of time, collecting a certain amount of items. But what's really interesting is that there are Japanese exclusive images that reveal some interesting tidbits. We see details like how Ridley and Samus' rivalry goes way back to when she was a kid, when he and the space pirates attacked her home and presumably killed her parents. Her being found and raised by the Chozo is also shown here. It would have been cool if these were unlockable in all regions, but what are you gonna do? While Fusion may not be my favorite in the series, not even in my top 3, it's still a good time. The story is compelling, gameplay is fluid, graphics and sound are on point for Game Boy Advance standards, there's lots of exciting moments and awesome power-ups, Metroid Fusion is fantastic. If you don't mind starting off with the fourth game and can tolerate the couple of not-so-obvious ways of progressing to the next area, I would say this is a good Metroid game to start with. Or I'd just say to start with a game that came out two years later, Metroid Zero Mission. And I will share my thoughts on that game in the next review. Until then, stay safe, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you for watching.
Thank you.